So, welcome everyone. So we'll just start with about 20 minutes of uh, sitting quietly. So uh, I'm assuming you're all already sitting comfortably. And so remember that for uh, practice of meditation, the point is letting go, relaxing. So let yourself sit comfortably. You can close your eyes. And just let the attention come back to the body. Just feeling the body. Notice how you're sitting, what the posture feels like. Take a note of where the mind is at and invite the attention back to the body just to be here and now. So we're sitting comfortably, as comfortably as we can. Noticing what the body feels like. If you're sitting on the floor or sitting on a chair, just not notice the weight of the body. And bringing attention back to the body is a very kind thing to do. It's kind to the body. It allows it to relax. It allows us to notice different areas of the body, what they feel like. It's kind to the mind as well. As we're letting go of all the business in the mind, thoughts about the day, about the week, thoughts about things that we've done that need to be done. We're bringing attention back, letting go of all of that for the moment, and just allowing attention to, attention to come and rest with the body. And when you let the attention come back to the body, noticing how your legs feel, how your hips and pelvis feel, which are the base for the seating position, the abdomen and the chest, the neck and head, shoulders and arms with the hands resting.
as we relax with the posture. Allowing sensations in the body into awareness. We're going to let, let the body relax too. And notice the breathing. Notice how you feel the breathing. What it feels like at the tip of the nose. In the throat, as you inhale and exhale. sensations in the chest as it expands and contracts. The sensations in the abdomen. Notice the sensations on the in-breath, bringing air into the body, and the sensations on the out-breath when we relax and let go of the air. So letting go, letting go of the tensions in the body, just letting them unwind through the breathing. And then letting go of the distractions that tend to pull the attention away from the body. Thoughts about the past, about the future. about the week that just went by, the one to come. Just notice when they arise and they tend to call attention to them. And just let them go. Just for now. 
come back to the body. Any ideas of anything you think you want to achieve in meditation? Let that go. Not trying to do anything, but just be here and now with the body as it is right now, and with the mind, whatever state it is right now, it's fine. And we're using the sensations in the body, sensations of breathing as an anchor, as a reference point. mind tends to like to move around. Go off in one direction, then in the next. And the body is here and now.
So when we notice the attention drifting off, come back and we establish contact with these sensations in the body. Come back to the breath. Allow all your thoughts and worries to dissolve into the breath. And just enjoy, enjoy the sensations of the breathing. Hi, brother and sister. Now we cast a Dharma talk from Ajahn. <clears throat> Brahma Jaroka Dipati Sampati Kantanjali An Diwaram Ayachata Santi Nasata Paraja Kajatika Dese Tutamang 
Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma samputassa Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma samputassa Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma samputassa Utang tamang sankang namasam Yesterday I was talking with Lumpo and uh, I was talking about letting go, which is something I like to contemplate a lot. How the whole path is about letting go, the whole practice is about letting go. <clears throat> It's a very good uh, short mantra. Let go. And it's a good reminder, and it really is what the heart of the practice is about. And the Four Noble Truths. The second noble truth, which is desire. We cling to desire, we attach to desire. And desire is a process that arises naturally. And through wisdom, we learn to recognize it and let it go rather than grasp it. Out of habit, out of ignorance, we're used to grasping hold of this body. We consider our bodies as us, as ours. We have some measure of control over them. We want to get up, we get up. We want to sit down, we sit. Being able to move it and use it gives us the impression that it's ours and we're in control of it. When we didn't have any control over the process of birth, we don't have any control over the change that overcomes this body, or the process of aging. We don't need to have any control over the rate of the heartbeat, the breathing, the digestion, all the metabolic processes of this body, thank goodness. If we had to keep track of those, we wouldn't have time to do anything. So this body is doing its own thing and eventually it'll reach the end of its tether and then won't be able to function anymore. And death is a separation, a dissolution of what holds this body together and keeps it functioning. And death is a moment of letting go. It's learning to recognize the nature of our experience, the nature of the reality of our experience is really taking a, taking a look at what our experience is made of. What is this body made of? What is this mind made of?
the Buddha in his kindness gave us the five aggregates as a way to uh, look at this body and mind, which is really a great gift he gave us. Because if you ever try to get your mind, wrap your mind around what experience, what your whole life is made of, it can be pretty confusing from the sheer abundance and variety of experiences that arise. And the Buddha suggested that we look at them just in terms of the, in terms of these five categories of the body, the feelings that we experience that are either pleasant, unpleasant or neutral, our memories, perceptions, our thinking and emotions and moods. And the last one is the way we experience consciousness through the five senses. So we can bring everything we experience, it all fits into one of these five categories, which is really magical. It simplifies our relationship to our whole experience and allows us to take a step back from it rather than get drawn into the confusion of it. It also turns out that when we look at our experience in that way, it's easier to start seeing how we grasp at our experience, how we grasp at the body as me and mine. How we identify with happiness and pain as my happiness and my pain, my sorrow. How we identify with memories and perceptions. We're always thinking about my life, my childhood, my history. And my experiences, my past. We identify with our thoughts our views, our plans for the future. We identify with how we experience the world through these senses. So this is a very beautiful tool we have, the Buddha gave us that we can use. to start to look at experience in terms of what it is rather than what we think it is or what we want it to be. And we can start seeing how we look at this body We all tend to think of our body as ours. This body is me. I can see that I can see an image of it there on the screen. When you look in the mirror, you see an image of this body. You look at other people's bodies, you see that. And in terms of bodies, in terms of vision, they are separate. So I'm here and you're there. And that's how we tend to function in the world. focusing on these different lumps of bodies. And if we look at it like that, then this one's mine and that one's yours. And this one's the one, the one that matters to me because this one, this is the one that I can feel. This is the one that I'm attached to. The 
And then when you start looking at the body, just in terms of what it is, you start noticing what we need to do to take care of it. We feed it. But then once you've swallowed your food, you don't have to worry about what happens. There's a whole bunch of things that happens after you've eaten your food until the time you need to evacuate what's left of it. The body does that on its own. Nature is at work there, not us, not me. I'm not in control of that. I drink a glass of water and once I've swallowed it, I don't need to worry about what happens until it comes out the other end. Nature takes care of that. The nature of this body is such that we need to clean it regularly. We need to protect it from the cold, from the heat. We can't let it be still for too long, it gets stiff. We need to move it around. We can't move around for too long because it gets tired, we need to rest it. So even though we may be associated with this body, it seems to follow the laws of nature much more than our desires and our wishes. When we contemplate like this often, we're informing the mind about the nature of the body the reality of the body. And as we learn to recognize the reality of the body and reflect upon it often and regularly, we come to accept it. Accept that it is the way it is. And then with that realization, we can start letting go of the ideas we have of what this body should do, what we want it to do, because we're in tune with what it is, with, what it, with its own nature. And we can start realizing, I may want it to behave a certain way, but it is doing its own thing. So this letting go happens naturally when we start looking at the nature of this body. It's the natural result of understanding the nature of the body. Looking at feelings, happiness, pain, joy, discomfort, ease, tension, or just neutral feelings. When we start looking at them and watching how they behave, what their nature is, how a pleasant feeling arises when you see a beautiful sunset, a flower blossoming in the springtime, 
you look out over the ocean, there's a sense of openness, pleasant feelings arise with these experiences. In this form of feeling, it's conditioned by the contact, by perception. But we can just notice how a pleasant feeling arises. We don't make it arise. It just arises on its own with causes and conditions. And when the contact that has given rise to a pleasant feeling changes, we look away from the ocean, from the flower, from the sunset. Then that feeling passes. Meditation, when we're sitting for a period of time, you can notice how bringing the attention to sensations in the body. Some sensations are pleasant. When the hips and the knees start to ache, that's unpleasant. And yet most of the sensations in the body are actually quite neutral. And when we bring attention to how these sensations are changing all the time, they rise, it exists for a period of time, and then it slowly fades. <clears throat> and you realize that there are two ways of relating to these feelings. One is the old habit of saying, I am happy or I am unhappy. And the other one is just noticing happiness arising and passing. Discomfort, stress or pain arising. And if we're patient with it, that too passes. And again, by looking at what the nature of these feelings are, the natural result is to let go of this idea that they belong to us, that we are them. We cannot be something that arises and ceases. We try to identify with it, so then we are born when it arises, and we experience death when it ceases, the form of grief. And then we're being born and dying every moment, every time we identify with a passing feeling. We're born, every time it passes, we experience death. So as we're sitting, watching the breath, we can also just notice how, as the mind tends to wander, it likes to just drift off with when memories arise. And again, it's really worth noting this difference in the way we can relate to a memory. When we identify, with this memory of last year, when we were young, when we were children, a memory of the past. If we're not paying attention, not watching mindfully, 
and remain in the present, we drift off with the memory and create the past out of that memory. And there's a difference between being here and now with a memory that arises here and now. And the memory is in the present, it arises. We stay with the present, we stay with the breath, we stay with the sensations in the body. And then as we breathe in and out, the memory passes and the attention just remains with the breath, settles with the breath. And that memory that arose in consciousness is past. That's a different experience from when the memory arises and we run off with it, we invest in ourselves into it. This was me. This is what happened to me. Me and mine and I arise with the memory. And we create this sense of, out of this memory that arises in the present, we create I, who was like this in the past. Notice the difference between those two ways of relating to a memory. And then when you stay with a memory and start drifting with it, then you start feeling a certain way about what happened to you. Or it could be you're thinking about the future and it feels a certain way and then we start experiencing certain emotions. We long for that happiness of the past, or maybe we feel regret and remorse about it. We're hoping for something to happen in the future. We're afraid of something that might happen in the future. And then these emotions start, to bubble, start bubbling up in the heart. created out of these memories and thoughts. I mean, these emotions grow enough and it starts developing into a mood. All this is being created, fabricated here and now. And there's a difference between being, bringing back the attention to this anchor, to this reference point here and now in the body and noticing a memory in the present, noticing a thought arising in the present, noticing an emotion arising a mood that is present. There's a difference between that relating to it as something that is arising in the present and identifying with it. My thought, my past, my emotions, my worries, my anxieties, my hopes, my problems, my plans. My experience of the body through these senses So when we're looking at letting go,
Letting go isn't something we can actually do. It's not like we feel anxious or worry. And then we just tell ourselves, let go when it happens. But it is the natural result of remembering that all there is, is here and now. All there is, is this consciousness, this ability to know the present moment. And in consciousness arises the experience of this body, these feelings of happiness or pain, happiness or sorrow. Memories arise here and now. Thinking arises here and now. Views arise in the present here. Emotions, moves, plans. So coming back to this present moment and remembering whatever I think is me, whatever it is that I'm experiencing right now, that's all it is. It's just an experience arising here and now that we're able to know the body is like this. Sitting feels like this. Sensations of the body are like this. Whether the feelings in the body or in the mind are pleasant, unpleasant or neutral, is something that's arising here and now. Whatever memory is arising, whatever you can think about the past is a memory arising here and now. Whatever thoughts of the future, hopes or fears, plans, Thinking about the future is a thought here and now that arises in the present. And so remembering this, remembering the nature of what is arising here and now, And when, when we are present, when we are noticing these things, we can't help but notice that they don't last very long. Memories come and go. You can't hold on to one for very long before it disappears. You can't think about the future forever. Think, 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 think. Eventually you get tired of thinking. Emotions change as well. So we can't help but notice the impermanent nature of experience when we're looking at it in terms of here and now, what are they now? And this realization is what leads to letting go, letting go of this idea that this body is me. It's a body. when it doesn't make it me. We can see how we create this sense of identity with the body. We create this idea, we superimpose this ownership onto a process, the body, which just belongs to nature. And so this path to letting go is here and now. It's coming back to the present moment, to consciousness, and how experience arises in consciousness, in awareness, in the present. And 
And then we can, we can realize that what we're experiencing is impermanent, it does change. And because it changes, there's no way we can find any kind of longing satisfaction in any of it. It may be temporarily satisfying, but then that changes too. And then it is a process of nature. It's nature who takes care of this body. It's nature that takes care of the mind. It is the nature of these experiences to arise and cease. And then we can rest with the awareness of it. The awareness becomes our refuge. Awareness that is here and now. That can witness arising and ceasing. That awareness which doesn't change. Because it's not attached to anything that arises and ceases. So I'd like to uh, end here for now. And I don't know if people have any questions they would like to ask. Andamaya Dhammakata Yasadu Karang Dadamase Sadu 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 Anumoda Thank you so much, Tanajan. I'd like now to welcome uh, brothers and sisters in this Dharma room uh, to join Tanajan uh, in this uh, very rare occasion that um, he's appearing here in front of us in the Dharma Zoom room. Um, so please feel free to ask him um, questions uh, regarding the practice. Right, I have uh, Elaine, just a moment. Eileen, you put out your hand and you put it down again. <laughs> Anyone who's got a question for Tanajan? No, perhaps maybe if I may just jump in and ask Tanajan about um, the reflections on letting go. Um, a lot of time, the thought about letting go is about something that's tangible, which is our body. What about learning to let go of bad thoughts or traumatic past. How does one deal with that kind of um, attachment and how does one let go? Well, it's always good to uh, learn to come back to the body and use that in the practice as an anchor to bring awareness back to the present moment. Because in the mind, we can so easily go off into the future and into the past. And the mind moves very, very quickly. And we can get caught up in a memory that brings emotions like traumatic, traumatic memories that are related to very powerful emotions that overwhelm us. But when um, then we lose our we lose our any reference point, we get drawn into it and lose the ability to step back from it. If we use if we learn to use the body as an anchor, it becomes a reference point for us because if we're sitting and determined to notice the sensations of breathing, breathing in. And breathing out, those sensations are 
arising here and now. So as we learn to bring the attention to the body, to the breath, or it can be just any sensation in the body really. As uh, in Thailand, there was a master, Nampo Tien, who taught this way of moving the hands. I'm not sure exactly what they are, but it, it, was, it was a kind of a rhythmic movement of hands like this. And a lot of people found that useful because the sensation you have in the arms, in the body, in the shoulder, when you're moving your hand, that sensation is here and now. I guess some people are familiar with uh, Goenka, Goenka's teachings. And he teaches, uh, he teaches a form of body sweeping. So you're sweeping through the body with your attention, learning to notice the sensations in the different parts of the body. So it doesn't matter how you bring the attention to the body, but as long as you learn and practice bring the attention back to the body and just learning how to bring it there and then how to allow attention to rest with sensations of the body. That will serve as an anchor and somewhere where the attention can come and settle in the present moment and relax. But it also serves as a reference point because then in terms of knowing, if we had determined to establish the knowing with the sensations of the breath, for example, then any, any moment the attention leaves the breath to go to something else, you know it has moved. It's left and it's starting to drift with something else. And this is how you can learn to recognize when the mind starts going chasing after a memory or a thought of the future. And these are intangible, like the sensations in the body are, are very uh, much coarser than sensations in the mind. It's easier to get hold of the sensation in the body than to get a hold of some of these very quick moving, flittering and uh, changing moods, emotions and memories in the mind. So using the body as an anchor is a very, very useful tool. And then as, as we learn to do that, as we learn to how to bring the attention back to the body, and once the attention is with the breath, how, how does it settle with the breath? Learning to relax, learning to breathe in deep, and as we breathe out, to let the relaxation of the physical relaxation of the body as it breathes out. When we breathe in, there's a sort of slight tension that is necessary to draw in the air, but then when we breathe out, we can just literally let go, relax. And with that relaxation, the air leaves the body, we relax, the shoulders can drop, we can relax the abdomen, we can physically relax the chest. We learn to use the body in a way we can kind of gently rock ourselves like we rock a baby to sleep while we're kind of gently using that gentle rocking of the breathing to bring the mind to some sort of sense of comfort and ease and relaxation. It's a bit like a leaf that drops off a tree and then it kind of has this movement of gently falling down to the ground and then it rests on the ground. And we can do that with the, with the breath and you notice how you can sit and your mind is a bit in an agitated state. And then as you sit down, just come back and take contact with the body. Contact the breath, contact the sensations. You can have this whole mental cloud of worries and emotions and concerns. And bring that whole thing into the breath and with as the breath comes in and out and every time you breathe out and you relax a little bit so it's like that leaf which is gently rocking down in the air, coming to settle on the ground. You can feel the mind gently settling with the breath. And then as it settles, as, and it doesn't matter how much, I, how deeply it settles, 
as it starts to relax, then you can start noticing how a memory that arises creates a kind of contraction in the mind. The mind contracts around memories. When we relax, things tend to open up and then something happens and causes an emotion and we contract again. As we relax, there's a form of stillness, physical stillness that we can feel in the body that transpires as a feeling of relaxing and stilling in the mind as well. As the body relaxes, emotions starts to unwind, thinking starts to slow down. And then you notice when it starts picking up again, because you're bringing your attention to this body, to this reference point, and gently guiding the mind back to this body, to how it feels, and then letting the breath take care of that, letting the breath hold that. And you notice how your breathing feels when you're agitated, when you're angry, when you're afraid, worried, feeling stressed, it feels a certain way. And then when you can bring the attention back to the breath, something happens, there's a natural uh, movement of letting go because we're holding on to something and we need to let go of that to be able to bring the attention back to the body. Attention tends to be attracted to memories, caught up in emotions, take off in imagining, imagining the future and what it may bring that we hope or fear. And then bring the, just bringing the mind back, remembering the body, remembering the breath, remembering what it feels like to be sitting, standing, walking, it's like a baby. You've noticed when babies are learning to grasp everything they find in front of them, they're sitting, sitting in the chair at the table and you're preparing dinner, preparing food, sit down there and they just grab hold of anything they can get their hands on. And sometimes in one hand, they grab a piece of cloth, put it in their mouth. The other hand grabs hold of a spoon. They're banging stuff on the table, cooing and crying and making all kinds of noises. And then you show up with something some food on a spoon or something, or even a little toy. And they're sitting there with these two things they just grasped. And you're giving them something else to look at, something else that they're now interested in. And there's a moment where they look puzzled sometimes because they're holding on to this stuff that they're enjoying, they're having fun with, but they want the third one and yet they have only two hands. They have to drop one in order to grasp what you're handing them. And you can see that, you can see that grasping happen in the mind. If you want to bring the attention, awareness back to the breath, sometimes you realize it's still stuck somewhere, it's still holding on to something, to a memory. If you want to come back to the sensations in the body, you need to let go of something. And so this is one of the exercises, one of the abilities we develop through practice, through meditation is learning where attention goes, what it's attracted to, and how we can bring it back to something else, to the body, to the present moment. And so there are some exercises that are uh, provide a, a sort of a coarser handle. So for example, some people experience panic attacks. It's a very strong emotion, a sense of intense, sense of losing control and fear and panic. And then it's very difficult in that state to come and say, just notice the subtleties of breathing in and breathing out. The, the emotional level we're at doesn't operate on that level. We need to give 
attention, which has been just sort of hijacked by fear and by panic and by these ideas that everything's going out of control, we're losing it. We need to give attention something on a similar level, another refuge, something to grasp hold of, that it can grasp hold of when it's in that state. And so we have these exercises of sort of, you can sort of start touching the body or clasping the hand and closing, clenching your fist really hard, having some powerful sensations in the body that are able to uh, compete with the power of the emotions that are grasping and hijacking attention. Some people just start breathing very, very deep and exhaling very deeply, way beyond the normal range of breathing. So if we're, our usual range of breathing is we breathe in and we breathe out about here, then now what we're doing is we're breathing in and going past that until our lungs and our abdomen and everything is chock-a-block full of air and we can't inhale another speck of air. And you can feel the tension in the body is much stronger and then breathing out and going all the way out. So we're, instead of just breathing in this amplitude, we're going all the way up here. Then when we breathe out, we go past the normal and expel all the air from our lungs until we have nothing else to give. And your whole body is contracting. So you're, you're still using the body, but you're using some very strong sensations in the body for the attention to come back to. It's like giving that baby something so interesting, so intensely desirable that it'll drop whatever it's holding, no matter how much it likes it, because this is, this is better, it's more. So when we're, when we're overcome with powerful emotions, whether it's arising from a traumatic past memories or whether there, some people just get very, we experience very intense anxious anxiety about the future, fear of the future situations we imagine and then the mind just takes off and creates some scenarios that lead us to experience some intense fear. So we need to come back, in order to come back to the body, we need to use something that's also more intense as a sensation to challenge the power of what's just hijacked attention in terms of memory, thoughts about the future and the very powerful emotions that can arise from that. And then when we start bringing attention back to very deep breathing like that, then as the, we use that breathing, match the power of the emotion we're feeling, and then gen very gently we start slowing down. And as the breathing slows down and gently comes back to normal, the emotion starts losing its power as well. It's almost like we're matching the emotion with the power of the breathing. And then as we learn to relax the breathing and gently slow down, come back to a more normal amplitude of breathing, a calmer breathing, that calms the mind. It calms the emotion. It, it gentles and gently dissipates the power of the emotion that arises. It was uh, Ajahn Buddhadasa who spoke a lot about Anapanasati. And he was saying that it is the most powerful way to condition the body and the mind is using the breath. Is that helpful? Yes, Tanajan. Thank you so much. The Someone has just asked me, can Tanajan uh, share a little bit about your life now in Amaravati since moving back to England? <laughs> How's uh, life for you in Amaravati now after having left Thailand? Well, the weather is different for one. Uh, temperate in a temperate zone, so we don't experience the intense heat and the intense humidity that we can experience in Thailand. And I grew up in Switzerland, so this is the kind of weather that I'm used to. But it's interesting also just watching how the mind 
what the mind makes of that. I did, I did spend about uh, eight, almost 18 years in Thailand. And uh, to the point that the weather in Thailand seems just normal, the tropical weather. So coming back to this, I find it quite pleasant. It's interesting sort of noticing going out. We got here in uh, Lompo and I arrived here on the 20th of January. And it was cold. We got uh, about a foot of snow outside just a few days after arriving here. And just realizing how memories, because I grew up with snow, I grew up with cold, I grew up learning to put on layers before going out. And at first, there was this interesting mix of familiarity with that and at the same time noticing how I just spent years just walking straight out the door and never worried about putting on another layer except a few days uh, a week or two in the winter when it's cold and then uh, coming here the community is quite large there were I think 75 people here in the monastery when we arrived there's a large group of lay people who are helping uh, with the winter retreat. And so uh, even in Watnana chats, uh, we don't usually have 75 people in the monastery, but even less so in Watnana one, where Lumpo and I spent the last eight years. So it was interesting sort of noticing the difference in dynamics in the larger community. It was very nice seeing uh, Lumpa settle in here to Amaravati because this is his monastery. This is basically home for him. And so it was very, uh, very beautiful to watch him go through the past the jet lag and the body being tired from the travels and all the hell all that has been going on in Thailand before we left arrive here, get out of quarantine, and as slowly the coronavirus pandemic restrictions are very, very gently easing, he gets to see more and more people. He got his, uh, his two jabs of vaccination, and uh, that allowed him to start, start receiving other monastics, like he sees Ajahn Amaro quite regularly. Ajahn Namaro comes for a morning cup of coffee and a chat here, and they're old friends. And uh, he meets regularly with uh, senior monks, the senior nuns, the junior members of the community. Uh, I think it took about um, a month or so, and he started going to the temple every uh, Uposata day full moon, new moon, and uh, half moons, and offers an afternoon reflection at the temple, which have been uh, published to YouTube. And he loves that temple. He's the one who designed it with the uh, architect, uh, Tom Hancock, and uh, George Sharp helped a lot with that. So he saw that temple go up. And he used to, when he was the abbot here, he used to wake up every morning around two in the morning, do a night, an hour of uh, either yoga or spend some time on the rowing machine just to exercise the body. And then he'd go to the temple and sit there from three o'clock onwards. And then the rest of the community would arrive at five, <clears throat> sit for an hour and they'd do some chanting. And he'd, then in the evening again, so uh, he spent years going to that temple and enjoying the space and the silence, giving talks. So the setting is so familiar to him and the community, there are so many members of the community who he knows for since decades. And it was very beautiful to see him come back here and come alive in a way that I haven't seen him come alive in Thailand over the, over the weeks, over the months that we've been here. And in, in a way, I'd be, I'm tempted to use the words 
that he's happier here, but it doesn't really make sense to say that because he was happy enough in Thailand as well. So if he can, he's perfectly capable of being anywhere and just being with the present moment and accepting it for what it is. So it's, he was extremely, he was very happy in Thailand. He was extremely well looked after. Ajahn Yanadamo and the monks in Ratanawan looked after him exceptionally well. And so there are absolutely no complaints he had about that. Yet coming back here with all the connection and all the past associated with this place and with the monastics and the lay people here, you can see it sort of makes him come alive in a different way. So that really has been the main, the main uh, feature as my, my role is really looking after him. I kind of participate in the life of the community as much as I can, but the priority is sort of looking after Lompo with uh, another monk, Ajahn Vinita, Sri Lankan monk. And uh, so that's really the focus for me here. And that's sort of the main thing that I've noticed is how it's changed for Lompo being back here. It must also delight you a lot, uh, Tanajan, coming back to Europe and spending your first birthday in Europe after so many years. Well, as a monk, you, you learn not to make much of your birthdays, really. I mean, sometimes birthdays go by and you don't tell it, but anybody, nobody knows, nobody remembers. And it's very nice to be able to have a birthday go by and nobody makes a fuss about it. In the West, you're used to people sort of making a fuss of your birthday. So at first, when you ordain and nobody does, it feels a bit strange. You sort of tend to feel a bit ignored. But then you realize it's really just conditioning. We're, we're, we're used to <clears throat> people making a thing out of it, but it's not really. It's just another day. And then as you get more seniority, more people tend to pay attention to that. So that changes. But no, I wouldn't say coming back here and experiencing my first birthday here was a thing really. But certainly for all of us uh, today being Father's Day to celebrate and to honor all our spiritual fathers in your presence, uh, it's really uh, a great opportunity uh, for many of us here, brothers and sisters. Uh, to us, uh, Tana Jana Soko, you, you represent the, the junior part of uh, Lompon Sumedo uh, for many of us respect and, um, uh, and have benefited from. You've taken care of uh, Long Po with so much care and love and atten attentive um, attention that um, it made us all also sit up and watch, you know, quite kindly to, to your behavior, your practice and um, your actions. So, you know, Anamodana uh, Tanajana Soko um, took me a year to invite you to this space, but really grateful. Um, that uh, you willingly accept uh, for this rare occasion to share space with us uh, today. Yes, I wish I knew how to use this thing better because I only see four people here. But, uh... <laughs> <laughs> so there are 20 people who, who are waiting to see you in the breakout room and in a little while. <laughs> okay. So are there any other last questions um, for Tanajan? Anyone here in this um, space, please feel free to put up your hand and then I will invite you to unmute. Because it's very early hours for Tanajan now, it's perhaps uh, 20 past six o'clock in the morning. Um, and um, he's got only about maybe another 20 minutes before he has to take leave and uh, to prepare for Pintapat and um, also to receive uh, long call. Anyone at all? Last chance. I do not know when Tanajan's going to say yes again to come to this space. 
Um, but uh, with a lot of gratitude, um, Ajahn. Um, thank you so much for caring for yourselves. Thank you so much for caring for Long Po. Thank you so much for sharing the nuggets of, um, of teachings um, so diligently every week. A few hours after it's been posted, we get a message from you receiving that gift of Dharma. So, Anamodana and Sadhu. I'm glad you enjoy it. We, we cannot put our forehead to the ground that you walk, but all of us now can put our forehead to this digital foreground that you, you are sitting on right now. Please accept uh, the three bows for all of us. So everyone uh, seems to be very delighted and very happy. Uh, Jan, are there any last words uh, before we close the session? Yeah, we can use this day, Father's Day. It's a convention in the world, but we can use this uh, to think, to recollect our parents, what they've uh, what they've done for us it's thanks to them that we're here now and also to recollect what in thai we call pome kubajan father mother teachers and um, recollect the kindness of our teachers how they've guided us how they still guide us how they nourish us and uh, it's a very pleasant way of spending the day thinking of our biological parents of our spiritual parents and just how much we have received all the goodness that we have received from them and if we indulge in these thoughts we find our hearts filled with gratitude that's a very pleasant way to spend the day so i encourage you to do that Okay, so um, in closing, uh, let us all now pay respect to Tanajan by chanting um, Araham. Uh, and then uh, for those who are staying back uh, to meet Tanajan in the breakout room, the room will be open shortly. Araham Sama Sambudo Bhagawa Buddha Bhagawanda Naviwa Devi Swakato Bhagavata Dhamma Dhamma Namasani Supatipano Bhagavato Savata Sando Sangha Namani Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya